Hello, I'm Maurice Dupre, and in this section, we're going to discuss integrals of vector functions. Remember, we know how to differentiate a vector function, just differentiate each component. Well, it's going to work the same way with integration. Integrals of vector functions. If capital R prime at t equals little r of t at each point t of the interval i, then capital R is an antiderivative of little r on capital I, and that's denoted integral r of t dt equals capital R of t plus capital C, now a vector. In other words, the big capital C that we attach after indefinite integration is now a vector constant, and so it is the set of all antiderivatives of little r. This symbol stands for the set of all antiderivatives of little r, so capital C with the arrow, that constant vector, is an arbitrary constant vector. In a sense, then, the capital C must be standing for all constant vectors. If r of t, that's little r of t, equals f of t i plus g of t j plus h of t k has integral components f, g, and h, then little r is integrable, and the definite integral from a to b of r of t dt will simply be computed component-wise. That is, we integrate little f from a to b, Notice that's a number, we multiply it by vector i. We integrate g from a to b, that's a number, we multiply by the unit vector j. We integrate h from a to b, that's a number, we multiply by the unit vector k. And then that total sum gives us the definite integral of r of t dt from a to b. That is, we compute integrals component-wise, and of course the same thing then works for the indefinite integral. That is, to anti-differentiate r of t, we just anti-differentiate each component. That's because differentiation is done component-wise, so that's all there is to it. Well, let's compute some integrals of vector-valued functions. Here, I have the definite integral from 0 to 1 of t cubed i plus 7j plus t plus 1 times k dt. So remember, that will be the same as the integral from 0 to 1 of t cubed dt, all multiplying i, plus the definite integral from 0 to 1 of 7 dt, all multiplying j, plus the definite integral from 0 to 1 of t plus 1 dt, all multiplying the unit vector k. Well, obviously, the antiderivative of t cubed is t to the fourth over 4. Evaluated from 0 to 1 just gives a fourth. So we have 1 fourth i plus 7 integrated from 0 to 1 dt. Well, that's just 7, so we get 7j plus, and now t plus 1. The antiderivative of t is t squared over 2 plus t evaluated from 0 to 1 times k. And so we have 1 fourth i plus 7j plus evaluating t squared over 2 plus t from 0 to 1, we get a half plus 1 or 3 halves k. And so there's our final answer. Well, let's work a definite integral of a vector-valued function. Here I have the definite integral from 1 to 4 of the vector function 1 over t i plus 1 over the quantity 5 minus t all times j plus 1 over 2t all times k dt. So we're integrating from 1 to 4. Well, let's do this by simply writing down the antiderivative of the integrand and evaluating between the limits 1 and 4. The antiderivative of 1 over t is natural log absolute t. So that we multiply by the unit vector i. The antiderivative of 1 over 5 minus t will simply be negative natural log absolute value 5 minus t. And so that is to be multiplied by j 
1 half the antiderivative of 1 over t, so that's 1 half natural log absolute value of t, and all that we multiply by the unit vector k. So there's our antiderivative, and we are to evaluate this antiderivative between limits 1 and 4. So we put in now our upper limit of 4, so we have natural log 4 times i minus, well, when I put t equals 4 here, I get 5 minus 4 is 1. The natural log of 1 is 0. And when I put 4 in for t here, I have natural log 4. And actually, one half of the natural log of something, remember, is the natural log of that thing raised to the one half power. So we would have the square root of 4 in there. So that's plus natural log square root 4, which is natural log 2, all multiplying by k. That's the result of evaluating at 4. Now I subtract the result of evaluating at 1. The natural log of 1 is 0, so we get 0 times i. Minus, when I put 1 in for t in this expression, I get natural log 5 minus 1. That's the natural log of 4 times j. And here, when I put in natural log of 1, I'll get 0. So we get plus 0 times k. So what do we have? Natural log 4 times i. What do we have for j? Negative 0j and negative negative ln4. That's plus ln4j. And then for k, we have ln2k minus 0k, so that's plus ln2 times k, and that's our final answer. When you have an equation that relates the derivative of function to another expression, what you have, in effect, is a differential equation. Let's solve a differential equation for a vector-valued function. Solve the equation dr dt equals negative ti minus tj minus tk with the condition that r at t equals 0 is equal to i plus 2j plus 3k. Well, what we know is, is that r itself has to be an antiderivative of that expression. So we can say r of t equals, and we can anti-differentiate term-wise, negative t squared over 2i minus t squared over 2j minus t squared over 2k. Is that all? No. Remember, when we anti-differentiate, we have to allow for the possibility of an arbitrary constant, because if I put any constant vector there and I differentiate this expression with the constant, it still gives me the exact same result. Now let's look at this whole expression, including the constant. What will we get if I put in r of 0? That is, what, if, what do I get when I put 0 for t? 0i, zero 0j, zero 0k, zero plus c. It just reduces to the capital C. On the other hand, r at 0 is given to us as i plus 2j plus 3k, so in fact, i plus 2j plus 3k is equal to r at 0, which equals c. That's giving us what that c must be. So r of t altogether is we need to add this vector to these three components. So we have 1 minus t squared over 2 times i plus 2 minus t squared over 2 all times j plus 3 minus t squared over 2 all times k. 
And so there is our solution to this equation dr dt equals negative ti minus tj minus tk with the condition r of zero is i plus 2j plus 3k. Well, let's see how we can find a vector function when we know its derivative and the value of the function at a specific time. Here, we want to solve the equation dr dt equals 3 halves t plus 1 to the 1 half power all times unit vector i plus e to the negative tj plus 1 over the quantity t plus 1 all times the unit vector k. And we have the condition that r at t equals 0 is simply the unit vector k. So we begin by writing down the general antiderivative for little r, that dr dt, that is this expression on the right. So we anti-differentiate each component. Well, to anti-differentiate t plus 1 to the 1 half power, we know we raise the power by 1 and divide by 3 halves. Well, that'll cancel that 3 halves, so we'll have simply t plus 1 to the 3 halves power all times i. To anti-differentiate e to the negative t, well, that's real easy. It's just negative e to the negative t. So we have negative e to the negative tj. And then to anti-differentiate 1 over t plus 1, we have natural log absolute value of t plus 1 all multiplying k. Is that it? No, we have to allow for the fact that there is some additive constant vector c, and we need to find that constant vector by using this fact that r at 0 equals k. So now we're going to set k equal to r at 0 and use our antiderivative expression to actually compute r at 0. So putting in 0 for t here, we have 1 to the 3 halves, which is 1, so we end up with i for the first component and then e to the negative 0, that's 1, so we have minus j plus, and now here, what happens when I put 0 in for t here? We have natural log of 0, of, excuse me, of 0 plus 1. So the natural log of 1, of course, is 0, and so we get 0 times k, and then we can't forget the constant c. i minus j plus c equals k. So let's solve that for c. That is, we have i minus j plus c equals k. So let's move these terms to the other side. c is equal to negative i plus j plus k. There's what c is. And so consequently, r of t, finally, its i component is that component minus 1. That is t plus 1 to the 3 halves minus 1 all times i. What do we have for j? 1 minus e to the negative t all times j. And what do we have for k? We have a uh, 1 here for our constant vector plus the natural log of t plus 1. So we have 1 plus natural log of the absolute value of t plus 1 all times vector k. Well, let's see if we can find the vector function when we know its second derivative as a function of time t and given the value of the function at time t equals 0 and the value of its derivative at time t equal to 0. Here, I want to solve d square r dt square equals negative 32k, where r of 0 is equal to 100k and dr dt at time t equals 0 is 8i plus 8j. I want to give you a way to think of this problem because whenever you see negative 32k, you should think in terms of 
real motion because the acceleration of gravity near the surface of the Earth is 32 feet per second per second downwards. That means written in vector form, the acceleration of gravity is negative 32 K. So that means you should think of this problem as specifying something about ordinary motion near the surface of the Earth, and we're using units in feet. And so if that's the case, r at time zero equal 100 k is telling us we're 100 feet above the origin. So think of the origin as being at the surface of the Earth, and then we're 100 feet above the surface of the Earth. dr dt at time t equals zero is 8i plus 8j. So that's a horizontal vector, dr dt, think of that as the velocity at time t equals zero. So here we have a horizontal vector going out at a 45 degree angle between the x and y planes, the, the x-axis and the y-axis direction. So think of that then as the initial velocity of an object thrown out horizontally at height 100 feet above the origin and thrown out in this direction. And so consequently, when I solve this equation, I'll be finding the position of that object at each time t. So think of this then as the velocity, and the second derivative is the acceleration. So let's begin by finding the velocity at any time t, since we know that the, the velocity has derivative the acceleration. So what is the, the derivative velocity? We have dv dt equals a, which is negative 32k. So that's easy to anti-differentiate. V at time t has to be the derivative of negative, the anti-derivative of negative 32 would be negative 32t k, and we have to add an arbitrary constant c. Let's find that arbitrary constant with our condition here, let's call this v sub naught, our initial velocity at time t equals zero is simply 8i plus 8j. So we'll say 8i plus 8j is v sub zero, which is the velocity at time t equals zero. Well, if I put t equals zero in this equation, this whole expression vanishes and I'm just left with the constant c. And so what we see is that the 8i plus 8j is this constant capital C in this case given to us by the initial velocity. So our velocity at time t is simply 8i plus 8j minus 32t all times k. Now we know the velocity, which remember velocity is derivative of position. So now we're in a place where we can find dr dt. Uh, we have dr dt. We can find r itself. Anti-differentiate again. r must be 8ti plus 8tj. And then how do we differentiate, anti-differentiate t? It's t squared over 2, so we get negative 16 t squared k. And now let's add another constant, arbitrary constant. Well, just so we make sure we don't get it confused with that one, maybe I'll call it a capital K. In any case, in order to find it, what we have to do is set t equal to 0 and we want to get 100 times little k. Well, notice if I set t equal to zero in this expression, every term drops out except for the capital K, and so that means that capital K is the 100 times the little k. So that's what that capital K is. So in effect, if I wrote this down, all in one piece, simply it would look like this. R of t is 8ti plus 8tj plus 100 minus 16t squared k. 
Well, let's see how to analyze projectile motion in general for an object thrown up near the surface of a planet with a given gravitational acceleration. I have the trajectory of an object which is thrown up. For simplicity, we restrict ourselves to the plane of motion of the object, and so we'll just have two components. We'll have the x direction and the y direction, so now we'll think of j vector as being the unit vector in the upward direction. So if the acceleration of gravity is g, so that's the gravitational acceleration, then it's coming down because the gravity pulls downward. So R of t is negative one half g t square times j plus v naught t plus r naught, where v naught is the initial velocity for which the object is thrown up or out, and r naught is the initial position. Notice that the arc is always a parabola. And here the assumption is that we're dealing with motion near the surface of the planet having this gravitational acceleration so that we can regard the gravitational acceleration as being constant throughout the motion. This would not hold if we threw something up to go sufficiently far away from the planet that the gravitational force significantly decreased. So consequently, in the special case where we throw the object up from the surface, here we have the equation with r naught equals zero. Notice again, we get a parabolic arc. r of t is negative one half g t squared plus v naught t plus r naught, and here r naught is simply equal to zero. Notice the acceleration vector is straight down. It's negative g times j. And here's the velocity vector at a given t tangent to the parabolic arc. Now, one thing we can do is resolve this motion into the horizontal and vertical components. So for instance, beginning with the initial velocity itself, notice when we throw the object from the ground, the initial velocity has a horizontal component, which would be length of v naught cosine alpha i, where alpha is the angle that the velocity vector makes with the horizontal initially. Then we have the vertical component, length v naught sine alpha j. So notice the acceleration is operating on only on the vertical component of velocity in general, and so the horizontal component stays constant. And so consequently, the position at time t is simply v naught, the initial speed, cosine alpha times t i. But for the j component, which is vertical, we have v naught sine alpha times t minus the one half g t squared times j. And so here, the angle alpha we refer to as the launch angle or firing angle or angle of elevation. Now, in this case, we can easily solve these equations to find, for instance, the maximum height. To do that, we simply look to see where the velocity is zero. And where it's zero, that would be the, where the vertical component of velocity is zero. Notice the horizontal component never changes for velocity. And so consequently, we find the maximum height has the equation v naught sine alpha quantity squared divided by 2g. We call the range capital R, and that's related by capital R is v naught squared over g times the sine of 2 alpha, and the flight time t is 2 v naught sine alpha over g. So we have three equations which come right out of this ideal projectile motion. That means, given the launch angle, notice we can find how high the object goes, how far it goes, and how long it takes to get there. Well, let's use our equations for ideal projectile motion to analyze how we can fire a gun.
What two angles of elevation will enable a projectile to reach a target 16 kilometers downrange on the same level as the gun if the projectile's initial speed is 400 meters per second? Well, here we need to know that the gravitational acceleration at the surface of the Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. So here we're dealing in units of meters instead of in feet. And so consequently, we have our range equation, which says the range is V naught squared divided by G sine of 2 alpha. Here V naught is the initial velocity, so that's the 400 meters per second. The G is the 9.8 meters per second squared. And here R is the distance downrange that we go, and so that's 16 kilometers. Here, alpha is the uh, elevation angle at which we fire the projectile, and so we have sine 2 alpha in this equation. So we put in 16 kilometers. Remember, kilometers, those are thousands of meters, so we have 16 times 10 cubed is equal to 400. That's 4 times 10 squared, all squared divided by 9.8, all times sine of 2 alpha. Well, notice what's going to happen here. You square the 4, you get 16, so they cancel. In effect, I'll just cancel it. 10 squared, squared is 10 to the fourth power, and so here, canceling with 10 cubed, we just have 10 over 9.8. And so what we end up with then is sine 2 alpha equals 0.98, which is 9.8 divided by 10. So what we want to do is simply look for solutions to that equation. Remember the sine curve graph, just to remember the sine, it's a sine wave. And so notice our angle of elevation alpha is some angle between 0 and pi over 2, but that means 2 alpha is some angle between 0 and pi. So notice if I put 0.98 here, which is slightly less than 1, it's going to come across and hit that curve twice. So there are two values of 2 alpha. Dividing each one of those values by 2, we find our two possible elevation angles. And they turn out to be simply 39.3 degrees or 50.7 degrees. That is, if I double either of these angles, uh, the sign of the result will be 0.98. The mean value theorem for ordinary functions says in particular that if two functions have the same derivative on an interval, then they can only differ by a constant. Let's see how this can be extended to vector-valued functions. Antiderivatives of vector functions use corollary 2 of the mean value theorem for scalar functions to show that if two vector functions, r1 of t and r2 of t, have identical derivatives on an interval i, then the functions differ by a constant vector value throughout i. B, use the result in part A to show that if r of t is any antiderivative of little r on i, then any other antiderivative of little r on i equals capital R of t plus capital C for some constant vector, capital C. Well, it should be quite obvious that B here follows from A. After all, if any two antiderivatives can only differ by a constant, then that would mean any other antiderivative can only differ by a constant from capital R. And so consequently would have to be capital R plus a constant C for some constant. So really what we have to do here is see how it is that the mean value theorem for scalar functions, the second corollary, will tell us that two vector functions having the same derivative can only differ by a constant. So just to be quite clear here, what we're assuming then is corollary 2 of the mean value theorem, which says that if 
f prime equals g prime on the interval i, then f minus g is a constant. So now we have our two vector functions, r1 of t, which we can write in component form, f of t i plus g of t j plus h of t k. And so I'm going to tag these component functions with the subscript 1 in each case. And now we have our second vector function, r sub 2 of t. I'll tag its component functions with the subscript 2. f sub 2 of t i plus g sub 2 of t j plus h sub 2 of t k. Well, if r1 and r2 have the same derivative, that means r1 prime of t equals r2 prime of t. Notice the only way that can happen because differentiation is done component-wise, the only way this can be true is for f1 and f2 to have the same derivative, g1 and g2 have the same derivative, h1 and h2 have the same derivative. So that means the difference between each of those two functions according to the second corollary of the mean value theorem must be constant. F1 minus F2 is constant, G1 minus G2 is constant, H1 minus H2 is constant, and so consequently R1 minus R2 is the constant difference of F1 and F2 times I, call that C1I, plus the constant difference of G1 and G2 times J, C2J, and the constant difference of H1 and H2, call that C3 times K, and notice what we end up with is a constant vector. So R1 minus R sub 2 is a constant vector, capital C. Well, we've worked some problems of anti-differentiating vector functions and integrating vector functions, and worked some problems with ideal motion. Now that you've seen these, you should try some on your own.